welcome to Open Mind Night, a show that talks about everything mental health and mental illness related. I am your host, Robin Tomanaha, licensed marriage and family therapist. Joining me on this episode is my guest, Randy Kim. He is a queer Viet Khmer American based in the Chicagoland area, original home of the Kickapoo people. Randy is the host and creator of the Bon Me Chronicles podcast. He is a board member with the National Cambodian Heritage Museum in Chicago and currently working on his master's in nonprofit management at DePaul University. He is currently working a three-year fellowship with Healthy Communities Foundation. Hi, Randy. Hi, Robin. Thank you so much for having me on. And I'm really glad that we've been connecting for the past few months, and I'm really honored to be on your show. Thank you so much for being here. I get so excited when I meet um, fellow podcasters, but also fellow like API podcasters. It like, it ignites me in a way where I get like super, super um, excited. So we'll dive into some of that. Um, But first, I'm kind of curious, um, how would you feel about sharing with the listeners or the viewers your journey, like kind of what your professional journey has been like, and even kind of how that made its way you know into the into the podcasting I feel like when I look back into my professional career it's been very messy in 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 many ways but it's also it's been taking on very different paths uh, for the past decade decade plus so I graduated from uh, UIC the University of Illinois Chicago as an English major and prior to that I actually wanted to go into journalism but I was having a lot of conflicts, and I think I'll probably share this later on, uh, as to what got me astray from the journalism field. But I was actually going to go into secondary education, and I realized that this was not going to make me happy. I could not see myself in a classroom uh, teaching in America. And I thought, well, maybe I might as well just try to finish up my degree and get an English degree and see what's out there. And uh, lo and behold, the Great Recession happened in 2008. And I had just completed an internship with a uh, for TV network, which, um, again, I probably would share more about that one later on. But to give more context, I wanted to actually dive into the, the field of journalism, specifically in sports, because I am a very passionate Chicago sports fan. So with the recession, following a very difficult job search, jobs just weren't opening. And then I ended up uh, going to Korea to be an English teacher over there for the next three years. And um, it was a very eye-opening experience for me because for me, there was nothing, or for a lot of, for a lot of us millennials, especially for those of color, uh, the, the job market was so dirt. And there were many millennials like myself that needed to find a different option. And the, the idea to teach abroad came up. Um, I know like China, Japan, and South Korea, th- those were hotbed uh, places for English teachers. And I thought, well, as an English major, why not? And I think in those three years, I've been able to travel um, and actually trying to figure out, well, what would be my next step uh, professionally. And there, and there I thought, well, I want to go into nonprofit work. Um, and I thought about nonprofit on a deeper level because I knew coming back to America, I felt my time to go into the sports journalism field had already passed me by. It had been several years. I was already unsuccessful in the job search prior to that. Um, but I thought what I've learned from nonprofit uh, being an English teacher, there was that I really enjoyed being in community with uh, with people. And there was uh, a volunteer organization that I joined where we were serving to volunteer at uh, local orphanages and domestic violence shelters. And it gave me a pathway to learn about what that, what that um, environment is like. Um, but I will also say that there's a lot to be said, um, especially when uh, these organizations are 
um, led by churches and led by white people. <clears throat> so there were things that I also confronted that I wasn't comfortable with, but then there was also part of the community impact that I had that I saw that, okay, well, there are certain things I can control um, in terms of my relationship with the people that I uh, built relationships with. And so I re recognize that I do want to go into that field, but I was also already kind of weary. He's like, okay, this is what I don't want to deal with. You know, the whole white savior complex of nonprofit uh, with a lot of NGOs. I did not want to go down that path, um, like what other people would go into. So um, coming back home, I got involved with Asian American advocacy when I used to work as an immigrant rights organizer for the Korean American Resource and Cultural Center. And then, um, then having to deal with, uh, and actually dealing with, uh, after the grant ran out, uh, my position wasn't renewed. So I was going into like different fields from, uh, I don't wanna get into this long story, but I will say that I've hopped into different nonprofits over the, last, over the next few years. And, and I gotta say that sometimes when you go through so many transitions and a short amount of time due to layoffs and unexpected uh, job changes, you're constantly on the go and you're constantly trying to figure out how to survive, um, especially when you're living alone and mm -hmm. trying to keep up rent. So there are times when I had to take pay, uh, pay cuts or taking jobs that were actually kind of beneath my own experiences. So I think getting to the more recency of my own experiences, that's kind of where I got into podcasting. Uh, it's also where I decided to go back to school because I felt that I was plateauing. About two years ago, I realized that, you know, I'm heading into my late thirties, feel that the last job that I had wasn't giving me what I needed to grow as a person, to feel that I have more agency in what I want to do. And I thought about podcasting uh, for several reasons. And well, part of it is because when I was going through, um, the, the, through my own uh, personal issues as a journalism student uh, in my undergrad years, I remembered having people that were supposed to be mentors who were also white tell me that I wasn't good enough to write. Um, I had I had one particular experience that was uh, traumatizing back then, and I remembered there was a Southeast Asian symposium at my community college. And as a Vietnamese and Cambodian person, this was actually the first time I started learning about the history of what my family had went through. Um, I wasn't really learning any of this from K to 12. Uh, being in a predominantly white community. And I was writing what would be, what was supposed to be the feature story for it. And I was also taking photos too. So I got a, so we got into this meeting, like our weekly meeting. I had the story finished, had the pictures finished. They basically said, we love the photo of the opera uh, dancer. They said, we're not gonna use your story. They gave me no reason. They did not tell me why they said, well, it's not good enough, or it's, they kind of casually said, well, I don't think it's important enough. And as a person who was turning 19, that was the first direct moment where I felt this, this, um, this very invalidating, very hurtful experience that, that, that something that my dad had told me, um, like when I was trying to go into that field, he was against it. He felt that because there were no Asian Americans in that field, this was off limits. And that actually kind of validated his um, belief. And it really started to kind of go into this path of uncertainty for me for the next uh, part of my undergrad career. You know, when I would go to UIC, this would follow me. Um, I kept thinking, well, they're not gonna value our stories, our community's history. So doing that podcast, I felt like I had to 
go back in time to re to recognize some of that pain that was that was holding me back from pursuing the fuller versions of myself to tap into the uh, into the being that I am and, and to tap into the history that my family and my ancestors have embodied in me. And then going back to school, I felt that I needed to, you know, sharpen my own skills. I wanted to take a lot of the experiences I've had both uh, professionally and as a volunteer to, uh, to make more of an impact or to be a better collaborator, to, to, to do work that continues to make me curious, to uh, help me pursue, find uh, opportunities to uh, collaborate, especially on causes that are very urgent to us. And, and I think as a podcaster, when I started my podcast about two plus years ago, I was thinking about this today. I felt like when I started out my podcast, it was like a love letter to my younger self. It was like a love letter to the Asian community that I've been connected with. Um, it was basically trying to tell that 18 year old, 19 year old self that was really hurting when um, his editor in chief flat out told him that I was not a good writer, that my story and my history, my own culture did not matter. Um, it was also that love letter to my 22, 23 year old self when I was an intern at, at that TV network. And when one of my peer mentors who was the same age as me, who had gotten the job several months before I became an intern, um, decided to use this power, um, power battles, uh, to, to use this power over me and to, to constantly question and interrogate me as an intern. So I felt like I needed to do that to undo a lot of the harm um, that I kept internalizing, that I kept rationalizing, that maybe I wasn't good enough, this wasn't for me. But then realizing, well, no, I think there's more layers to this. There's more to, more to this. Uh, it wasn't fair that I did not have the support that I needed uh, from my peers and it was also very hard when you don't have people who look like you that that could give you the the guidance to navigate in a very white dominated field right so so that was also part of me starting my own pockets like i felt like i needed to to uh, really celebrate these parts about me that uh that are very important as a queer vietnamese khmer american but also also for our own community who grew up not having to see themselves on TV, in books, in radio, in magazines, and also in uh, elected offices. I'm glad that the landscape is changing, but it's also an opportunity for us to document our own stories, to, to document our own vision and what do we want to see it manifest into uh, moving forward because we still have many ways to go. There's still a lack of our own understanding of our history and the people who have been fighting for alongside with us. And I think this is a, this is a really important uh, motivation to have podcasts and it's not just me, it's also with you and with so many other Asian American Pacific Islander folks who are doing this because for so long we our stories have been gatekept by by uh, white-led institutions who aren't green lighting our stories and aren't telling it in a way that actually goes further because some of what gets on there is uh is quite sanitized and only meant for uh white comfort right so for us it's about using our own experiences and to tell it unapologetically on our platform and on our own time. Thank you for sharing that. Oh boy, so many thoughts and so many questions. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm kind of going, I feel like it was a long roundabout way, but, but yeah. 
No, I think, I think you described it very well because it was this up until, you know, now like your journey and, and what it's been like, I remember too, man, back in like, Oh my gosh, that 2008, 2009, I remember how that really uprooted a lot of things for people, especially BIPOC, right? Because it is harder, you know? And then the journalism, you know, that journalism experience sounds really tough. And I think I totally agree in that like mentorship is important, but also representation, you know? And there are a lot of spaces like journalism, I think, years ago, the pandemic kind of shifted things a little, but I remember even the podcasting world was um, predominantly, you know, Caucasian. I think of like mm -hmm. a particular network that's like the original podcast, you know, and even that originally was predominantly Caucasian. So it's important for us to take up these spaces, take up space, have presence in these spaces, and also for like current and like future generations or current and future people in that field because it, it just, it matters, matters like so, so much. And true mentorship, mentorship where it's like, you said someone looks like you, there's like, they understand culture. There isn't like this power differential. They're actually wanting to help. Like inclusion, like is so, so important, you know? And I think it's, it's interesting too, like, and I agree in even my, um, my experience, I never intended to be a podcaster. Ever. I mean, I tend to be a therapist, but, <laughs> um, but, but I mean, essentially it was like, I, I had some point I realized like, this is like a big platform and how great would it be to really kind of, this is called open mind night, but like a mic, you know, like you hand the mic to someone, someone who gets to share their own story from their personal experience, because I think stories are so much powerful, so, so much more powerful and actually authentic when it comes from the person who has lived experience, right? Right. And so I th I'm trying to recall what I thought when you were describing your story, but I think it was along the lines where I almost felt like, you know, when you mentioned you kind of in a way got re-in touch or more in touch with like past you by having the podcast, right? It almost sounds like um like a, also even like a discovery process in a way, because you're right, you're right. Even like my culture and with my family is very similar where things weren't really talked about, like the complete story or someone's actual lived experience in something that was political, something that was had to do with war. Like it was kind of like I, I knew from the news or sort of textbooks, but like it wasn't until, unfortunately, sometimes when someone was later in their life where I actually found out like, how they experienced something that was very, very difficult and, co and collective. I'm Japanese American. So it was kind of like, I think within mine, it was more like the internment camps. And even then, like, I didn't find out a lot of those stories until much later. And there's still some that mm -hmm. I haven't heard. No, you're right on that. Because I think to also sharing how, what I, what little did I know about my own Asian American identities, I did not learn about that history of myself until I was about 30 years old and I'm 38 now and it wasn't until I left Korea coming back to America and being involved with Asian American spaces uh, particularly uh, the queer trans uh, spaces because um, I did not learn who Grace Lee Boggs was until that time it was actually the credit the credit goes to the activists who I've been very fortunate to be in connection with. Uh, it was through social media that I learned about who Yuri Kojiyama was or Brett Kuramatsu or um, Helen Zia. And what's also very sad about it is there are people in our millennial age group that don't know who these people are, despite how, how important their contributions are. I mean, most, um, I think that there is a statistic and I'm, I can't remember the exact number, but there's a vast majority of non-Asian Americans that don't, that couldn't name a, an Asian American activist or educator or leader. And I think that really tells you a lot about how far the invisibility goes and how detrimental that is to our own survival, to our own health, to our own ability to thrive. And yeah, representation matters, sure. But what about equity? What about dismantling tokenism? If you have like five Asian reporters, 
well, who's on the board? Who, what does the executive leadership look like? So I think when I hear representation matters, I just kind of like, it, I kind of bristle pretty quickly on that because like, yeah, Crazy Rich Asians became a big box office set, but guess what happened next? You know, Adele Lim uh, can't get green light and she's so severely underpaid versus her white male counterpart. There's a reason why it's not green lighted because she caught it out. And guess what? America does not deserve another Crazy Rich Asians because they're not fixing the damn problem. Yeah. Um, and and that's why I have a cynicism towards it, but I'm also optimistic that we're not going to just stand idly on this at all. We're, we can, we're going to call it out and shout it from the rooftop and educate our younger folks to not settle for less. You know, for growing up with refugee parents, it's about survival. It's yeah. about, he- and survival sometimes means having to sacrifice a lot of our own history, our own culture, our own pride to just to assimilate to a narrative that was only meant for uh, for making white people comfortable. Mm-hmm. So when we're teaching our younger generations, non-parents or as uncles, as, as teachers, that it's important for us to make sure that, that we uh, normalize this new version of us and so that way uh, historical figures and current ones who are making history now are not going to be forgotten and that their fight wasn't in vain. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I agree. And I think even the the whole crazy rich Asians thing, I, I always had interesting feelings about that, like the movie and like, or the story, <laughs> yeah. the book, but because it's like very small and I feel like I don't know, and this may be a little off topic, but you know, you brought up um, in some sort of way, like, you know, I always think like my model minority and like, and two, right. I, I'm more about like the, all the stories, you know, and yes. the We're whole not... range of experience. And I feel like Crazy yeah. Witch, or, um, yeah, Crazy Witch Asia was very like, I don't know, I kind of, it, it wasn't, it didn't settle too well with me as, as far not as the, only like, one. Mm-hmm. the Asian dysphoria you know, diaspora looks like? We don't live in the Kevin Kwan world. We, none of us do. You know, we don't live in, in Elon Musk type homes. We, we don't, that's not our life. You know, yeah, it's great to see, you know, different Asian American, a- Asian actors um, out there. Great, but it's not our, it's not something that a lot of us identify with. So we also have to keep dismantling and infiltrating like what Hollywood wants or what they see as being successful. Um, uh, yeah, because like if Hollywood thinks that a box office success means just having um, a movie about uh, about ridiculously uh, wealthy Asian people and doing action movies, then we're only limiting uh, the scope here. You know, um, there's also other Asian folks. I mean, uh, besides the East Asian experiences, um, Mm-hmm. And there's also different spectrums. I mean, you got LGBTQIA, you've got people who are disabled, deaf, um, blind. You have different intersectional experiences of the Asian and then Pacific Islander experiences. And, and we just can't focus on the most um, visible of our community. Yeah. And, and out of curiosity, you know, how... Um, as like a podcaster, and especially like with your podcast, you know, how do you go about like honoring, you know, the guest stories or, you know, using that platform for your guests? Hmm. Well, I think, I think uh, when I first began the show, it, I remembered uh, being in the storytelling uh, community for about a few years. And there were times when I would share uh, particularly vulnerable stories. And, and a lot of the storytelling spaces I was in was also predominantly white. And a lot of the stories that I would hear would often be very entertaining stories in contrast to the stories that I would share. And I would always feel like very out of place. And after telling that story, and when it's all over, it's like, you know, it didn't feel supportive. It didn't feel like 
like I feel like I'm just performing trauma in a sense rather than finding community um, rather than uh, finding the kind of uh, kind of a uh, bond that I would have with other storytellers although I have in in, in the past uh, been connected with other folks who uh, who have you know shared their vulnerability who have shared their vision in their stories and so I recognize that as a podcaster, there's a responsibility to, to honoring uh, how or what a person shares, especially when there is particularly, particularly trauma involved. I think what I try to be very mindful of is, is understanding what my mission is, understanding that it's, it's to also navigate into the intersectionality of our own experiences through the layers, but also to recognize that we deserve to celebrate ourselves in this, that, that we are growing as people, that we're not defined by just the trauma in our stories, that we are eventually defined by our ability to, to grow and to evolve as people along the way. And there were times when I know uh, before I talk to a guest, before I record uh, an episode with a guest, if I know that there are going to be some difficult stories, I would, you know, set up a pre-call and have a conversation about it. I'd like to understand what their comfort level is if this gets brought up. How would you like me to to process this with you? Like how? Because I'm not a therapist, um, first and foremost. It's not a therapy session. Uh, the goal of my show is to make sure that you get to tell your story and that that we work on an outcome of what we would like to see this episode be, to look like. That is very important because it's not just my show, it's also their stories. And I want them to have agency in being able to tell their stories because for me, it's a privilege to do that. You know, it's a privilege for me to to get that trust, which is very sacred because like any time that they open up, that means that they are open to having that relationship with you. And I think that's something I take very, very seriously. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's important to just to go over it with your guests beforehand and, and also think about your own understanding of these issues too, because you don't wanna go in completely blind or ignorant of uh, ignorant of what they want to do because if they shared something and and you're not reacting very well to it then I think that that also tells you about uh, about how this may not be an area that you are uh, versed in talking about so I think it's okay to acknowledge uh, times where you don't understand these experiences but just acknowledge that you know, thank you, just by saying thank you for sharing this. Um, I really appreciate you for bringing this up. And also thinking about your own self-reflections, like I will have to look up this topic, this history more. I will look to do better. I think just even acknowledging what you don't know is important rather than just dismissing it. Because yeah, I, I don't like to keep people in their trauma once it's open. I think it's important for me to help you know, navigates like what what is what are we leading this conversation into? Why does this particular event in that person's life matter, and how is it connected to the uh, to the beautiful work that they're doing, to the connection, to the reconciliation that they've made for themselves? Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's that I think there's more power to it. Um, the trauma is only part of the experience, but not the full entree. It's it's just part of what connects it to the actions that we take. Right, right. I like what you said too about, um, it sounds like, and, and I love that. And I do the same where it's like very collaborative, but also knowing and being aware and talking about like the limits and boundaries, you know, when it comes to these topics and, and how, it's, um, how it's gone about, you know? And, and you're right, like there's like the trauma component, but there's also like the big picture and all these other things, you know, for, and let me know if this is like, okay, um, you know, when we have guests on or, you know, we talk about these, you know, deep topics and, you know, with people, 
we I think we also have like our own our, our own experience with it as like you know the podcaster and the person that you know is kind of maneuvering and like providing that stage for people and kind of in a way sometimes absorbing it you know so and I I think one thing that comes to mind just it's kind of a general term I think in in general for this but like almost like experiencing and listening to someone else's trauma can sometimes lead someone to experience maybe some part of like vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It, it sure can open up. Um, I would say like over the summer when I was still continuing my podcast and I think I was still going at a pretty frenetic pace on top, on top of work and on top of other responsibilities that were just holding me at bay. And and I think it was around the time of the anti-Asian violence that it started to pick up because I was starting to do episodes and having some, I guess, share some of their own experiences, particularly with childhood. And, you know, as much as I resonate with so many stories, and then trust me, I do. Um, there's a reason why I have them on because I see myself in a lot of these stories too. Not obviously not completely, but um, but enough that actually that I get very consumed by it. And it's not something I like to admit to, but I think that there was a time when over summer, I think there was two episodes I was recording in one day, which I rarely do, but I just felt like schedule wise, I was trying to fit that in and realizing that both of the, both of their stories were very, very heavy. And towards the end, I think by the end of the night, I was just like mentally, emotionally spent. And it took me about a week for me to, to feel, um, I don't want to say back to myself again, but to feel functional again, because it's not only just hearing these stories, but also having to uh, spend a lot of time processing, how am I going to maneuver it? Uh, what kind of conversation am I thinking about? sometimes I feel like I have to go back into my own past in order for me to understand. And I don't think that's always the most healthiest thing to do. Uh, but I also at times feel like that is also where my connection comes in, in these interviews, because mm -hmm. I, because for me to better understand it, I sometimes have to look back in my own history. And I think that there's no easy way to, uh, to prevent vicarious trauma. I think it will happen at times when you least expect it. Uh, what I can say is just giving yourself enough grace if you have to pause uh, from the recordings, if you have to excuse yourself, then you know, by all means, please do. And be transparent about it with your guests too and, and the people that you would like to have on because I think it's, it's a labor of love, but sometimes that labor can be very crushing. Um, and I think it was like around the beginning of September where I said, you know what, I've got to take a pause uh, from this show for the next, until next summer. And, you know, right now we're into winter and honestly, it felt great uh, for the past two months of not releasing an episode. I feel great about not scheduling an interview. Um, I, I, I still do. I still promote some of my re-releases as of late. And that's actually kind of fun for me because at least I get to kind of reintroduce them back um, because for a while I was releasing weekly episodes for a good period of time. And that can be very taxing. I mean, you gotta deal with uh, not only the scheduling, the recording, but the editing, then you gotta do writing the show notes, um, the promotion of it. Um, yeah, the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, and that can be very, and that was very taxing for me. So uh, I don't miss, uh, I don't miss uh, working on an active uh, season right now, <laughs> thank God. But, but I do have the hunger for it. I mean, there are times where I feel tempted. It's like, oh gosh, I'd really like to interview so-and-so right now. Um, or this, this uh, current event sounds very important that we really need to talk about. Um, but I think it's good for me to pause and to give myself a better rest uh, and a better reset, because I think what I really don't want to do, and I've seen a lot of podcasters fall into it, is that they get overwhelmed, 
they give up, they become some ways um, jaded and leave it all together. And I don't want to be in that position where I feel like I'm obligated to do this for my followers. I have to do this from a, from a good place, uh, from a good mindset and not from a place of scarcity and hope and trying to remind myself to do things from a place of abundance. So, um, and I think even when I get back to it, I'll have to rethink about how it will look like. Uh, I don't think I would do weekly episodes. I can guarantee you that's the first thing I will not be doing is that it'll be done bi-weekly. You know, it'll be done every two weeks or however it's going to look like. And maybe I'll shorten up my seasons as a result. But that's the beauty of discovering of what isn't going to work for you. And that's when you give yourself the opportunity to put your foot down and say, you know what, I got to stop. Um, I got to stop before this starts to escalate into something more difficult to climb out of. Yeah, I think, um, and I remember when, uh, months ago when you had announced that, you know, you're taking like, kind of like more of a respite or like a little break, you know, and, and maybe because like, I work in mental health, but I'm old. I was like, yeah, self-care, you know, like great, like to, you know, acknowledge that and be able to give that, you know, to yourself. But it, it's, it's interesting because it's like, and, and I get it too, where it's like, when you have a passion and something like you're so excited about, mm -hmm. you're really wanting to like, keep going with it and keep going with it. And that yes. can drive you to continue to, um, do more episodes and think about those ideas all of a sudden and be like, wow, that person would be great. But it's like kind of a tricky balance because yeah. not just with the vicarious trauma, but also kind of like leading into um, leading into burnout because, mm -hmm. you know, especially for those of us that are, you know, we're not like a part of some, you know, big like media company. We're, there's a lot of like back end behind the scenes stuff that's happening that people don't know about the pre-production and post-production. And I remember when you're doing like weekly episodes and I was like, wow, like, I, you know, as someone who's also a podcaster, I was like, whoa, like that's, you know, that's, in, that's intense. Cause I know like the labor that that takes, although it comes from a place of like love and like passion. Um, but the, also the benefit of even with podcasting, um, is you get to create your own schedule and that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, it, it does. And also I feel like I get to dictate, uh, my agency of how I want to go about it. And and also, I think it's important for me or for everyone to recognize that, yeah, I, I was riding on a lot of momentum too. I mean, I was having all these incredible guests mm -hmm. and there's like more topics that keep me very curious that I feel like, oh yeah, we need to have these discussions and I can't wait to just bring it out to the universe. But then realizing that, you know, I could still pause and I'm not going to feel shame in doing that, um, that I'm not going to worry about whether people are going to forget about me for the next couple of months it's fine i think you have to let certain things go because uh what really made my show connect with uh folks and and some of these folks became good friends of mine is just being very transparent just being very honest with yourself and being genuine that you care because once you start to get that burnout it will come across it's gonna show those cracks will start to appear you know like maybe if i do a live video if, if i feel very irritated or i had a conversation um, I, I will say that there was one example I, I i will you know own this up but i think towards the end of the summer there was a cambodian content creator who i absolutely adore i think he's really he's 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 a he's, a, he's does a lot of incredible work but i think he was putting his like top 10 cambodian uh influencers or like a podcasters and I was not included on there and I think I made a shady comment I was like well it's like you kind of forgot one person you know and I think I did it from a place of of feeling disrespected mm -hmm. because I felt like here I am busting my ass off for the past two years like I may not be fully Cambodian but I think it also triggered that part too because you know being mixed definitely didn't help but I, I felt that the last is for two years going, you know, like I have done weekly episodes. I have brought on, brought on like community members to, um, to prolific guests and I'm a one person team. So 
you, I, I felt some kind of way about not getting that kind of respect. And I realized like, why did I do this in the first place? And I had to really hold myself back here and really check myself in and say, you know, why did you do this podcast? What's more important to you? Um, and I kept telling people that it's about connection with community. It's about being able to learn more about myself and learn about the people that I'm in connection with. I think that these are incredibly important. This is what keeps me going. But then when I started to think about the lack of respect factor and I started to think more of like, well, why are people paying attention to this so-and-so? This is putting me in a very unhealthy place. And this was putting me on a path of being bitter. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be in that, in that mindset. And that can become very toxic, not just to myself, but to the people around me. Um, so I had to think about that. But I also realized that this was a sign that I needed to step away from myself before I started to feel this vindictiveness or uh, or like, you know, driving myself into this work and realizing that I'm not getting anything out of it. And that's not what I want to venture into. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky position, you know, cause, cause it's nice to be like acknowledged and recognized, right? Like that, mm-hmm. that feels good, especially when you put your heart and, and your soul into something that matters and your why for doing the podcast is huge, you know? And then sometimes, you know, cause I've been, I've experienced that as well, where um, it kind of gets lost sometimes. And then part of me is like, oh no, I hope this doesn't turn into some other thing, like the followers or like maybe certain recognition, all that. When really like, that's not what this is about, you know? So yeah, so it's kind of like taking a step back, you know, from that. I always say like, I mean, I'm a podcaster, but I'm also like a podcast listener. I started out as just a podcast listener. That's all I thought I was going to be doing. Um, and for me, it's always been the content. And that to me mattered as a listener. Um, or potential listener, as opposed to like, whatever else fluff is, you know, fluff is happening. You know, for me, it was like, is this topic resonate? Is this topic meaningful? Is this going to have an impact, you know, and at least like one person, you know, and, and I think for me, like, and, and when I initially heard yours too, like, that's what stuck out to me. Like, I don't think I'll ever forget you. Like, even if you took a break, for like two years or however long you want to go on a vacay somewhere. Like, I don't think I'd ever forget you and yours because I remember like even way before we connected, I was like a listener of your podcast and a fan. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this is so, so amazing, you know? And I, and I would just sit there and like, I always have this routine where I listen to it in the morning just to kind of like, you know, get my gears going and everything. And I remember listening to yours and I'm like, this is so cool. You know, and I hope other people listen to this too. <laughs> yeah, that really means a lot. I truly appreciate that. I, I really do. And I'm just very thankful. Anytime I would get a DM from someone who was just listening in and hearing that, I, I love hearing the stories because it actually just kind of reminds me, it's like, wow, this is why I did, did it in the first place. It's because I want people to feel these stories. I want people to feel seen. I want people to have the permission to tell their own stories I want people to to see the work that's already in progress I mean and I'm proud of that as as a queer Southeast Asian American I'm proud of our community and I want that feeling to be heard in whether it's in California or in Iowa or in Brunswick Canada for all I care I mean in the most remote parts of the world I want people to feel seen and I want, and I, and I will say this because um, I remember my brother uh, uh, one time said, well, no one's going to really care about us. Like, you know, no one's going to really care about these stories, you know? Um, And I took that personally and it's something I never forgot. And it's like, no, it's, it's going to matter. We're going to matter. Uh, It's just that it needs to be, there needs to be more light on that. I mean, the work has been happening for the past um, century and a half in America. It just hasn't been shown in the light that it deserves. And, and because we have all these tools, it's getting there. I mean, we're seeing, um, despite the 
anti-Asian violence, despite a lot of horrible things that have happened to us in our communities. Uh, we're seeing like this push to have Asian American education in taught in public schools, Illinois, including, uh, and, and we're seeing more content creators, we're seeing more people really take up spaces, take up space, infiltrate them, whatever. And I think that's encouraging, you know, we need to have that continue. And also to show that we're in solidarity with Black, Indigenous, Latinx communities too in this fight against white supremacy and what that solidarity can look like because I think there's always a saying that um, the, the minority becomes the majority when we're all together. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I look at when I think of uh, the podcast. Yeah, it's not just a podcast for me. It's, it's, it's our ability as a, uh, as a collective to just tell these stories and, and, you know, they may not be listening to my podcast, but they're listening to other um, podcasts as well too. And, and I'm glad that there's more than just, you know, me or you and, we need to have more of our voices because we can't be the only ones telling these stories. Well, is there anything I didn't ask about that you'd want to touch on or say or talk about? Um, I don't think so. I think that this is certainly um, the good chunk of uh, what we're looking at, what, uh, what we uh, are going to talk about. I know that, that, you know, about these experiences, it's, um, it's always very complicated to think about how many different fragments of our own life, but they are, how they all intersect with one another. And I had to think about it too, as I was going into my professional career and how that actually connects to the podcast work itself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always an interesting challenge, you know, to talk about things that you haven't talked about in that kind of way, um, because, it requires deep reflection and requires a space to uh, talk about that. Well, before we wrap up, um, like you said, and I want to remind like the listeners and viewers that uh, you are doing kind of re-release or replays of the Bombay Chronicles. So everyone can definitely check that out. I believe it's on like all podcast platforms, I believe. Right right? Um, so definitely do that. And then other than that, if the listeners wanted to find out more about you or Bomb Me Chronicles? Is there anywhere they can go, like website or social media handles? Sure. So you can uh, follow me on Instagram at Bonmi, B-A-N-H-M-I underscore Chronicles. You can find me on Instagram. you also get the uh, latest update. I'm also on TikTok, which I'm starting to use, but I'm not professional at it. I am not going to do silly dance videos because I don't have enough time for production. I also have a Facebook page called The Bun Me Chronicles that you can follow as well. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yes, you can also check out uh, the podcast on all platforms. And yeah, there will be certain re-releases. Some of them will be released as video through Spotify. Thank you, Spotify, for bringing that to light. And That's cool. I, yeah, and I hope to, that you get to catch up on the, all these episodes before I venture out into new ones uh, sometime uh, mid-2022. Uh, mid okay. Cool. And what I'll do is I'll put all of those um, in the show notes. And then also the, the video version of, of this episode will go on the YouTube page, um, <clears throat> the Open My Night YouTube page. So I'll put that in the description as well. So everyone can just easily click on it. So no. yeah. So thank you so much for doing this. It was a pleasure connecting. I was so excited. And then also having you on. So thanks so much for doing this. Well, thank you so much for bringing me on. And the best of luck to you in your podcasting journey. And I really appreciate what you've been doing and keep it up. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, take care.